Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today we start a new unit, new module, new chapter, World War II. And let's just say it's much, today's lecture is very much a review from what you learned about last year. So let's get into it. It is long it is 42 slides long and so in the video there's not going to be real much um, expanding on um, the slides because well it is kind of a review so therefore but there there is a lot to write there is a lot to write um, so World War II, module 11, two title note day. So remember, put that, uh, World War II up in the upper margin of your, of your paper. The war breaks out or war breaks out module 11, lesson one. Okay. That was your warm up. Objectives. We're going to define the terms of the Treaty of Versailles and explain how it led to dissatisfaction among European rulers. We're going to identify the types of governments that took place in Russia, Italy, Germany, and Japan following World War I. We're going to explain how these new regimes sought to expand and how Britain and France responded and summarize the first couple battles of World War II. All right, so why they're mad. So the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, left many European nations dissatisfied the treaty's war guilt clause placed the blame for the war solely on germany remember it also demanded that germans pay reparations which are payments for the damages and expenses caused by war the amount demanded far exceeded what the german government could even afford so instead of securing a just and secure peace the treaty of versailles caused anger and resentment germans saw nothing fair in the treaty that blamed them for starting the war remember they didn't start it. They were also stripped of their overseas colonies and border territories. In terms of the treaty, um, also did serious damage to their economy. It forced Germany to give up control of some of its major industrial regions, which made reparation payments more challenging. In a world that is ever industrializing, losing those, it's a big issue. These factors also helped bring about a period of severe inflation or rising prices. Prices increased to such an incredible rate that by 1923, the German currency had ceased uh, to have any meaningful value. Also unhappy with the treaty was Italy. Italians were on the winning side of the war, and they hoped to be rewarded with territory as part of the treaty. Uh, there was a secret agreement that you know was made between the Allied powers that if Italy went to the allied powers and they won they would get parts of austria back didn't happen so those were those calls were largely ignored during the peace talks similarly dissatisfied the soviets resented the carving up of the parts of russia remember the soviet union wasn't even invited to the paris peace conference the treaty of versailles the peace settlement had not fulfilled uh, President Wilson's hope for a safe a world safe for democracy. The new democratic governments that emerged in Europe after the war floundered. Without democratic tradition, people turned to authoritarian leaders to solve their economic and social problems. And these new democracies collapsed and dictators were able to seize power. Some had great ambitions. All right, and Joseph, we trust. So for Russia, or Soviet Union, hopes for democracy gave way to the Civil War, uh, which resulted in the establishment of a communist state officially called the Soviet Union. After Vladimir Lenin died in 1924, Joseph Stalin took control of the country. Stalin focused on creating a model communist state. In doing so, by reading you know, the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich Engels, he made both agricultural and industrial growth the prime economic goals of the Soviet Union. Stalin abolished all privately owned farms and replaced them with collectives or large government-owned farms, each worked by hundreds and hundreds of families. Stalin moved to transform the Soviet Union from a backward rural nation into a great industrial power. 
1928, the Soviet dictator outlined the first several five-year plans for industrialization. In 1937, the Soviet Union was the world's second largest industrial power only to behind the U.S. But the human costs of these plans were enormous. Stalin set out to uh, purge anyone who threatened his power. You could say he was a little bit paranoid. Uh, while the final toll may never be known, historians estimate between 8 and 13 million people were killed during this time on purpose. And millions more died in famines caused by the restructuring of the Soviet society. 1939, Stalin firmly established a totalitarian state that tried to exert complete control over its citizens. And in a totalitarian state, individuals have no rights and the government suppresses all opposition. So there's Vladimir Lenin, who um, is still like that. To this day, um, they preserved, embalmed his body, and they spend quite a bit of money every year trying to preserve his body that's been dead for almost 100 years. There's Joseph Stalin, and that's a, I googled Farm Collective. That's what I got. All right, the moose. So while Stalin was... Busy consolidating his power in the Soviet Union, Benito Mussolini was establishing a totalitarian regime in Italy where unemployment and inflation produced bitter strikes. Some of those strikes were actually led by communists. Alarmed by these threats, middle and upper classes demand stronger leadership. Mussolini took advantage of the situation. A powerful speaker, Mussolini knew how to appeal to Italy's wounded national pride. He played on the fears of economic collapse and the fear of communism. Oh, my. Sorry about that. By 1921, Mussolini had established the Fascist Party. Fascism stresses nationalism and placed the interest of the state above those of individuals. To strengthen the nation, fascists argue power must rest with a single strong leader and a small group of devoted party members. The fasces in Latin was a bundle of rods or bundle of sticks tied around an axe handle. It was a symbol of unity and authority of ancient Roman times. So, uh, playing on ancient Rome and the civilization that started it all, Mussolini will gain a lot of support from doing that. So, in 1922, Mussolini marched on Rome with thousands of supporters he called, or they called, black shirts, because, you know, they wore black shirts. When important government officials, the army, and police sided with the fascists, the Italian king, Victor Emmanuel III, is it the third? I think he's the third, appointed Mussolini the head of the government. So he is now seen as a legit ruler for someone to be appointed by an actual king. You're legit. Your government is legit. So calling himself Il Duce, or the leader, Mussolini gradually extended fascist control over over every aspect of Italian life. Mussolini had achieved the sufficiency of running the country by crushing all opposition and making Italy a totalitarian state. So there's Mussolini, and that's the fascies. Here are his black shirts. Um, this picture is probably redubbed from the March on Rome, because... Uh, they didn't have color back then, but they have color now. All right, from one leader to the next. Everyone hates Adolf. In Germany, Adolf Hitler had followed a path similarly like Mussolini. He actually admired Mussolini. At the end of World War I, he had a jobless, been a jobless soldier wandering, drifting around Germany. In 1919, he joined a group called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, a.k.a. Nazi Party. Despite its name, there are no ties to socialism whatsoever. Hitler proved to be such a powerful speaker and organizer that he quickly became the party's leader. He called himself De Führer, or the leader, promising to bring Germany out of the chaos. Um, he will then get arrested, as we know, and then he'll write his memoir, Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, where Hitler set forth the basic beliefs of Nazism that would become the basic plan of action for Nazis. 
Nazism is Germany's brand of fascism, and it was based off extreme nationalism. Hitler, being born in Austria, living in Germany, fought for the German military during World War I, had a dream of uniting all German-speaking people in a great German empire. So Hitler wanted to enforce his racial purification at home, In his view, Germans, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Aryans, formed a master race that was destined to rule the world. Inferior races like Jews, Slavs, and all non-whites only served the Aryans or were fit to serve the Aryans. A third element of Nazism was national expansion. He believed that in order for for Germany to thrive, it needed more Lebensraum or living space. The Great Depression helped Nazis come to power because of war debts and the dependence on American loans and investments. Germany's economy was hit hard. Six million Germans were unemployed. Many of those unemployed men joined Hitler's private army, the Stormtroopers, a.k.a. the Brown Shirts. And let me guess, they wore brown shirts. By 1932, the Nazis had become the strongest political party in Germany. In 1933, Hitler would be appointed chancellor, a.k.a. prime minister, like second second in charge he will then use that power to dismantle the weimar republic and establish the third reich so there's hitler there's his book um can't really find aryan race on on google but you get the picture and there's all his brown shirts. All right, Japan. Japan was another country torn by political and economic conflict. Among the problems facing Japan was the limited size of their territory. The islands of Japan were growing crowded and crowded each day. At the time, Japan's government was under civilian control, but the people were unhappy with its leadership. Dissatisfaction was especially high among members of the military who held strong nationalist beliefs. The early 1930s, um, a group of military leaders used violence to take control of the imperial government of Japan. And like Hitler and Mussolini, these leaders believed the need for a strong army to achieve the country's goal, philosophy known as militarism. Many Japanese wanted to expand their territory and gain greater access to wealth and resources. You know, we when you have in Europe the those, the race for colonies and the growth of imperialism, Japan didn't really have that. So this is Japan trying to be an imperial power at the same time. And that's their military. All right, Spanish Civil War. So in 1936, a group of Spanish army officials led by General Francisco Franco rebelled against the Spanish Republic. Revolts broke out all over Spain and the Spanish Civil War began. The war in Spain aroused passions not only in Spain, but across the world, too. Such limited aid was not sufficient to stop the spread of fascism, and Western democracies remained neutral. Although the Soviet Union sent equipment and advisors to one side, Hitler and Mussolini backed Franco's forces with troops, weapons, tanks, and fighter planes. This war forged a close relation between the German and Italian dictators who signed a formal alliance known as the Rome-Berlin, or Rome-Berlin Axis. And after a loss of almost 500,000 lives, Franco's victory in 1939 established him as Spain's fascist dictator. So fascism is spreading around the world, around the world. Uh, that's Francisco Franco. And I looked up Spanish Civil War. This is what I got. Growing the Empire. So... 1931, Japanese militaries began working to achieve their goals of growing Japan's territory and access to resources. Ignoring the protests from more moderate Japanese officials, they launched a surprise attack and seized control of the Chinese province of Manchuria that was rich in natural resources. This was also a significant test of the power of the League of Nations. Remember, the League was created following World War I. The League sent representatives to Manchuria to investigate The report condemned Japan, who, in response, will just leave the League of Nations. What are you going to do? The success of the Manchurian invasion put militarists firmly in control of Japan's government. As Germany began to expand its territory in Europe, it opened opportunities for Japan's expansionists. July 1937, Hideki Tojo, chiefs of staff of Japan's Kwantung Army, launched an invasion further 
deeper into China. As French, Dutch, and British colonies lay unprotected in Asia, Japanese leaders leaped at the opportunity to unite all East Asia under Japanese control by seizing all the colonial lands. And Asia for Asians is what they wanted. Will they get it? Time will tell. Uh, here's the invasion, Manchuria, and that's Hideki, Cho Hideki Tojo. <laughs> More aggression. The failure of the League of Nations uh, to take action against Japan did not escape the notice of Europe's dictators. Hitler will leave the League in 1933. 1935, Hitler began to build up the German military in clear violation of the Treaty of Versailles, TOV, Treaty of Versailles. A year later, he will send troops into the Rhineland, the German region bordering France and Belgium, which was demilitarized as a part of the Treaty of Versailles. Also, one of those vital industrial regions that were taken from Germany. The League did nothing to stop Hitler. Meanwhile, Mussolini began building up his new Roman Empire. He, he wanted to create a Roman lake around the Mediterranean. His first target, however, was Ethiopia, one of Africa's remaining independent countries. Remember, Ethiopia, back in the day, embarrassed... Um, Italy, I believe, I want to say in World War I, but I also want to say it was before World War I. So Italy had not forgotten the big fat failure of being able to defeat someone much weaker than them. So they go back to Ethiopia, and by the fall of 1935, Italians stood ready to advance on Ethiopia. When the invasion began, the League's response was in, a, in an ineffective economic boycott, basically a slap on the wrists. And by May, Ethiopia fell. Uh, their leader, Haley Selassie, uh, appealed to the League of Nations in person. Nothing was done. So there's the German military. Uh, moving into the Rhineland, this yellow area along the Rhine River. This is um, Mussolini invading. And it kind of kind of sucks for Selassie because Eritrea and Somaliland, or modern-day Somalia, were Italian um, Italian colonies in in Africa, so they got them from both sides. Can't stop, won't stop. November 5th, 1937, Hitler met with his military advisors in secret. In order to grow, he boldly declared that they must take the land of their neighbors. The plan was to absorb Austria and Czechoslovakia into the Third Reich. Austria was his first target. The remnants of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. Majority of Austria's 6 million people were Germans who favored unification with Germany. In March 1912, or March 12th, uh, the German military marched into Austria unimposed. A day later, Germany announced that its Anschluss, or union, with Austria was complete. And that was, again, prohibited via the Treaty of Versailles. Later, he will turn to Czechoslovakia. About 3 million German-speaking people live in the western border regions of Czechoslovakia, which was called the Sudetenland. This mountainous region, however, prov provided defense to a German attack. But Hitler, being extra, wanted to annex Czechoslovakia for more living space and its natural resources. So he spun a little propaganda in saying that uh, the Czechs were abusing the Sudeten Germans. And he will send troops to the border. All the while, the press would be producing propaganda to steer national opinion to favor annexation of Czechoslovakia. So here's Austria down below and this is the vote for germany being annexed not germany for germany annexing austria my bad and then this uh lighter area is the sudetenland of three million speaking germans and this is hitler Ooh, I'm about to talk about this meeting peace in our time so early in the crisis both uh, France and Great Britain promised to pr 
protect Czechoslovakia. Then, when war seemed inevitable, Hitler invited Premier Edouard Daladier and British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain to meet with him in Munich. It's called the Munich Conference. When they arrived, the Führer declared that the annexation of Sudetenland would be his last. I mean, he, he pinky promised, guys. He pinky promised. In their eagerness to avoid war, Daladier and Chamberlain chose to believe him. September 20, 1938, they signed the Munich Agreement, which turned the Sudetenland over to Germany in exchange for peace. Chamberlain's satisfaction was not shared by a man, uh, his rival, political rival, Winston Churchill. Churchill believed that the signing of the agreement of Daladier and Chamberlain adopted the shameful policy of appeasement, giving up principles to pacify an aggressor giving in to keep the peace. And this is Neville Chamberlain holding the document that says, peace in our time. He said he will stop seizing land. Oh, you wish, you thought. Mewage. So like Czechoslovakia, Poland had a sizable German-speaking population. In the spring of 1939, Hitler began... The familiar routine charging Germans in Poland were being mistreated by the Poles and needed his protection. If an invasion were likely to occur, it might provoke the Soviet Union on Poland's eastern border into battle and invoke de protective declarations by both France and Great Britain. This would result in a two-front war which certainly exhausted Germany in World War I. As tensions rose over Poland, Stalin surprised everyone when he signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler. Once bitter enemies, fascist Germany and communist Soviet Union committed never to attack each other and then signed another secret agreement that they would divide up Poland together. And the two-front possibility of war was avoided. And this is, Mer we'll talk about this in class, but you have Hitler as the husband and Stalin as the wife. All right, it's on like Donkey Kong. So September 1st, 1939, the war officially starts when the German Luftwaffe, Germany's air force, roared over Poland, raining bombs on military bases, airfields, railroads, and cities. At the same time, German tanks raced across the Polish countryside, spreading terror and confusion. The invasion was the initial test of Germany's newest military strategy called the Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War. Blitzkrieg made use of advances in military technology, the fast tanks, and more powerful aircraft. To take the enemy by surprise and crush all opposition with overwhelming force. Two days later, France and Great Britain declared war together on Germany. Blitzkrieg tactics worked perfectly. Major fighting was over in three weeks, long before France and Britain and their allies could mount a defense. In the last week of the fighting, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east, grabbing up some territory. Germany annexed the western half of Poland, containing two-thirds of its population. By the end of the month, Poland ceased to exist. World War II had begun. So imagine a blitzkrieg. This isn't really how it looks, but you get bombed by the planes and then the tanks roll in. And then, I mean, this looks more like trench warfare, but you know, I was making this at one o'clock last night. You get what you get. For several months after the fall of Poland, French and British troops along the Maginot Line, a system of fortification along France's Eastern border sat staring at Germany, waiting for something to happen. On the Siegfried Line, Germany, German troops stared back. The Blitzkrieg gave way to the Germans calling it a Sitzkrieg, or sitting war, and newspapers called it the phony war. After occupying eastern Poland, Stalin began annexing the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Late 1939, he sent his army into Finland. After three months of fighting, the overwhelmed Finns gave in. Suddenly, April, 4, April 9, 1940, Hitler launched a surprise invasion of Denmark and Norway, but in truth, he wanted to build a base so he could attack Britain. Next, he will turn to the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, which were overrun by the end of May 1940. This is the Maginot Line in green. This is the Siegfried Line in red. All right, Nazis in Paris. France's Maginot Line proved to be ineffective. The German army threatened to bypass the line during its invasion of Belgium. Hitler's ger generals sent their tanks through the Ardennes Forest, a region of wooded ravines in northwestern France, thereby avoiding British and French troops and continuing on to Paris. The German offensive trapped almost 400,000 British and French soldiers as they fled to the beaches of Dunkirk on the French side of the English Channel. In less than a week, a makeshift fleet of fishing trawlers, tugboats, river barges, and pleasure craft, a.k.a. yachts, 
More than 800 vessel, vessels in total ferried about 330,000 troops to safety. After a few days, Italy entered the war on the side of Germany, invaded France from the south as Germans closed in on Paris from the north. Hitler invaded. Hitler handed French officers his terms of surrender as, Nazi, as Germany would occupy a northern part of France in a Nazi-controlled puppet led by Marshal Philippe Pétain would be set up at Vichy in southern France. After France fell, the French general Charles de Gaulle fled to England where he would set up a government in exile. That's Dunkirk. Hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed that movie with Harry Styles. Your boy did not. That is Dunkirk. This is France, 1940-1944. That is Pétain on the left and someone who didn't like him, Charles de Gaulle on the right. All right. I believe this last slide. Uh, bombs over Britain. So, summer of 1940, Germany began to assemble an invasion fleet along the French coast because of its naval power. They knew they couldn't compete with the British, so they launched an air war at the same time. Luftwaffe began bombing, making bombing runs over Britain. Its goal was to gain control of the skies by destroying Britain's Royal Air Force, RAF. The Battle of Britain raged through summer and fall. Night after night, German planes pounded British targets, concentrating on airfields, aircraft, then on the cities. The RAF fought back brilliantly. With the help of new tech of radar, British pilots accurately plotted the flight paths of German planes, even in darkness. And for one day, September 15th, the RAF shot down 185 planes, only losing 26. Six weeks later, Hitler called off the invasion, and that is one of Hitler's first failures, is not being able to take and invade successfully Britain. I looked at Battle of Britain. I got planes. Here's a map. Uh, it was called Operation Sea Lion. Um, and that's it. Uh, I know it was very long, a very longer, longer, uh, hello, um, lecture, I know, sorry, a lot of talking, a lot of notes, so we'll keep this outro quick and fast, your homework is page 496, 496, page 496, 4 through 7, page 496, 4 through 7, if you guys did enjoy that, Make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.